I do have the honor and privilege of introducing the speaker for tonight. The Honorable Judge John Charles Thomas is a senior partner at the law firm of Hunton Andrews and Kirk, where he serves as Chief of Appellate Practice. Judge Thomas is also a judge of the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne, Switzerland, which handles cases involving violations of the World Anti-Doping Code for all Olympic sports, the Tour de France, FIFA, and LPGA. Judge Thomas holds the distinction of being the first African American at 32 years old, the youngest justice appointed to Virginia's highest court by former Virginia Governor Charles Robb in 1983. And Judge Thomas was educated at the University of Virginia, where he graduated with distinction in 1972, and then he earned his Juris Doctor from UVA Law in 1975. Judge Thomas is a frequent speaker and lecturer across the country and, in fact, the world. Judge Thomas has taught appellate practice at the University of Virginia School of Law. He served as a jurist in residence at Gonzaga University, and he is the recipient or has been the recipient of the NAACP's Lifetime Image Award and has been a vision speaker at James Madison University. Since 1990, Judge Thomas has delivered the first day, first year law lecture at one or more of several prominent law schools, including UVA Law, the University of Louisville School of Law, and my alma mater, the College of William and Mary. Judge Thomas is a recipient of the Belisles Award from the Virginia Bar Association, and in 2014, he was named Distinguished Alumnus of the UVA College of Arts and Science. He's also a poet who's recited his own works at Carnegie Hall. And Judge Thomas and his wife, Pearl Walden Thomas, are the parents of three children and the grandparents of two. Judge Thomas, we welcome you and we thank you. Thank you, Megan, for that wonderful introduction, but we have three grandchildren. Can't, can't, can't be missing no grandchildren, people. <laughs> it's a joy for us to be here, my wife and I, coming here to Longwood and coming here to Farmville, and to be with you this evening as we think about the important work that was done here at the Bowdoin School all those years ago. As we sit here tonight in this beautiful place, surrounded by friends, black, white, young, old, in wonderful conversation with each other, it is almost impossible to remember just how broken, divided, fragmented, torn up, asunder Virginia was 69 years ago. It's almost impossible to understand how young people, prompted by one young girl, could have taken on the monolith that was racism and hatred in Virginia and made it move out of the way. What happened here all those years ago is astounding. It is something that we need to drill down on and pay attention to because as she pushed back the darkness then, there is still darkness that needs to be pushed back today, and we have to understand what it was she found. <laughs> so that we might be able to find it again in our own time. I have been thinking much about what Barbara Johns did as a 16-year-old all those years ago. And one of the thoughts that came to me talking to one of my friends is that she understood and she answered Esther's call. Do y'all remember Esther and Mordecai in the Bible? You remember that Esther came and told her uncle, I have come upon something horrible 
they're going to kill all the Jews. And our uncle said, you got to do something about it. And she said, why me? And uncle said, because you do not know but that you were placed in the kingdom for such a time as this. Barbara understood Esther's call. And when you understand Esther's call, it makes you examine yourself at every moment whenever you are in the presence of injustice or darkness and evil. And it makes you say to yourself, what do I need to do? What is my role in this situation? And she said, I have to speak up. Now we know that she was motivated by her uncle Vernon Johns who was outspoken about independence and about standing your own ground and having your own place and doing your own hard work. We know that she had that in her. But when you look at the movie over at the Moton School, that we, the portrayal that we did, you look at that, just think about a young child asking a teacher or a principal to leave the room back in 1951. <laughs> Now, it's amazing that they did. I'm younger than Barbara was, but when I was in school in the 50s, if I had asked a principal or teacher to leave the room, they would have thrown me up against the wall, I think. <laughs> but they listened to Barbara. Now, I was talking to Barbara's sister before this started. She said, y'all just need to know Barbara was bossy. <laughs> So the, bossy, the bossiness in Barbara must have caught the attention of these teachers and the principal to make them go ahead and get out of the room when Barbara asked them to do that. But you know what she was saying in part was, we don't want y'all to get in trouble, grown people. You might lose your job. They might put us in jail, but remember she said, the jail ain't big enough to hold all us. And so she was fearless in what she was doing. But we have to, as we sit here today, remember that wherever we are and whatever we're doing, when we're in the face of injustice and evil and darkness, we have to ask, what is our job? What do we supposed to do? Now, she, she has characteristics of somebody else. There was another youngster that we know about from the Bible who told the grown folks, y'all get out the way. Do y'all remember David and Goliath? David's mama sent him with some food to take it to the front line to feed his big brother and the others who were going to take on Goliath. But David got there and he saw that all his brothers and the men were all terrified by the giant and they were afraid. And David said, hmm, I can handle this myself. Now, people don't always understand it, but David had spent his time protecting the sheep with his slingshot. So he knew that he could hit the wolf in the middle of the head and make the wolf leave the sheep alone. And so he understood that I've got the ability. And so he stood up and he said, y'all might get hurt, old people. Y'all step out the way. Y'all leave it to the young folk because I have the ability to do it. And so look what all this that was inside of Barbara. And, and then there's another thing that she did that, that makes me think of the Karen movie. Anybody seen Harriet? Somebody didn't seen Harriet. Remember the beautiful song, uh, Stand Up, Bring Your People With You. Didn't she do that? I mean, of course, in this room are people who were on that strike that day. In this room right here, there were some people who were there who were part of that. But this young girl was the one who brought him along. I mean, when we look at the movie that we did, she's in there talking. There had to be discussion like that. Y'all show this right? I think I need to go back to my room. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want no whipping when I get home. We can handle this, y'all. Let's do it. And so she spurred people on. I think it's just the most amazing thing. And look at it. This little town ain't even no interstate nowhere near y'all. <laughs> you got to come down 607 or 307 or something to get out here. We got a little piece of 460 coming close by. But basically, this little town here in the middle of Virginia, people know about you all around the world because someone stood up for right and stood up for just, ain't that right? You can clap, go ahead. That's an amazing thing. Now my friend Lisa is over here doing poetry and music, which I love, 
and the poet is in me too, and the poet makes me stand here and talk about poetry as it applies to Barbara. Y'all know the Psalm of Life, Longfellow's Psalm of Life? He might have written that just for Barbara Johns. That's the poem that says, tell me not in mournful numbers. Life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returneth was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow finds us further than today. Art is long and time is fleeting and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating, funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within, and God o'erhead. Lives of great ones all remind us we can make our lives sublime. And departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn or shipwrecked brother, seeing she'll take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. Ain't that Barbara? Didn't she have a heart for any fate? Didn't she take them on? Aren't we here tonight because she left footprints in the sands of time? We couldn't have been in a room like this in 1951, but now there's sculpture of Barbara on the state capitol grounds. There's a portrait of Barbara inside the state capitol building. There are buildings named for Barbara. A little child who did that, who had that kind of courage, isn't that amazing? But when we confront evil, we're not doing it just to get our names on buildings. When we confront doctors, we're not doing that just so somebody will paint our picture. When we do these things, we do it because it's right. We do it, the reason that Dr. King said he did it, because what he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And Dr. King, the ministers know what I'm going to say. He answered the Macedonian call. He said, wherever there's wrongdoing, I'm going to be. Wherever there's a need, you're going to find me. Wherever there's injustice, I'm going to stand up. That's what we have seen starting right here in this place. And what I want to say about Barbara is that she had light. She had light to fight the darkness. She had light inside of her, did she not? This should not brighten up the room. That's what some of the people say. When Barbara came in here, everything changed. When you were talking to her, you couldn't help but be captivated. Her will was so strong. Ain't that right, sister? That was the nature of Barbara. And that's the kind of people we have to be when we confront darkness in our own time. Now, I actually have a poem that I wrote that's called Like the Soul. And that poem is saying to all of us, basically, we have light within us. And that poem says that what we got to do is use our light in the ways that Barbara used her light. So I'm going to tell you, light the soul. Light lay quietly at the beginning till it was called into action by God. Then it split the darkness, warmed the cold, brought motion to the stillness, touched our souls, and they say there is light at the end. As we brace ourselves for the final journey, the word is there is light even then, light that blinds you, binds you, then sets you free. From alpha to omega, the light shines through. From dawn to dusk, it orders what we do. By particle and wave, it prompts the birds to sing. By pulse and reflection, it points out the way. Light can lift depression, dispel despair, bring hope to the weary, lead us from fear. Light can raise up emotions, quiet the storm, beckon us from rolling seas into the calm. 
We learn by light. We grow by light. We sit in the dark, transfixed by its sight. And as the light flickers, our hearts respond. We can see the connections. We can feel the bonds. It has been given to some to handle the light, to mold it, to craft it, to bend it to right. It has fallen to some to sculpt what we see, to sharpen, to brighten, to make it run free. To those who would hold light in their hands, there is much to remember to understand in the right light love can shine. In the right light we can leave wrong behind. By the light there is good we can know. In the light justice can grow. As we sit here tonight, we want to remember the suffering that our forebears went through. We want to remember the journey that they had to take to overcome. But we don't want to just stop there. We do not want to analyze for, uh, Prince Edward County as if, it, as if it's some specimen in a museum. Because the problems that we had then can come back any time, even now, unless we are ready to be barbers everywhere we go in the world. And in the beautiful words of Dr. King, what he tell us, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. That means that all of us are in here together because what affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. Ain't no escaping having wrong in your house. If it's there, you better clean it up. If it's there, you better stand up. You better bring other people with you. You better lift up the world and make it better. This is the charge that we have been left with from these noble young people from 69 years ago, even as babies confronting authority, even confronting their own mamas and daddies until they got the attention of Thurgood Marshall and got the attention of Oliver Hill and went on to become one of the great cases in American jurisprudence. That's the kind of remembering we got to do, people. Let's take that away from here when we leave here tonight. God bless you.